Welcome to Rainier View. My name is Erica. We are so excited as you're joining us today as we continue in our series titled Called, where we'll be taking a look at what God is calling us to as a church. Today, we're going to talk about how we can move forward when we feel stuck. And we wanted to share our heart about some of the exciting ways we can do that together. Here's Pastor Jeff. Hey, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Rainier View, and we are excited that you're joining us for our series called, where we're looking at the things that we believe God not only calls us to individually, but also together. Because I believe most of us desire better in our lives. I think many of us believe that God wants good for us, and yet so often we can find ourselves stuck in our lives. And so this series all is all about really figuring out how do we move from that place of feeling stuck to moving forward towards the good things that God has for us. And all throughout the series, we're looking at the examples of people who have gone before us uh, in this history of faith that we have, and we can look at how God has led his people forward, and we can learn from those examples. And so today, we're out here, uh, right off of the sound, and we're looking at the story of uh, Moses parting the Red Sea and leading the people of Israel out of slavery into freedom. You know, many of you probably already know the, the rough outlines of the story, at least, whether or not you come to church right now. Uh, you know, we know that Moses goes to Pharaoh, who was king of Egypt at the time, and he says, let my people go. I don't know if that was his voice or not, but that's how I imagine it, right? And Pharaoh says, nope, not going to do it. God sends 10 plagues, one after the other, and Pharaoh says yes every time, but then he changes his mind once the plague goes away. And so on the 10th one, he lets the people of Israel go free. Moses is leading them, but Pharaoh changes his mind, right? Uh, apparently losing millions of people as free labor for his country. It was too much for him to take. He chases them down and he finds them with their back pinned against a giant body of water, right? And he says, I've got them now. And yet Moses leads the people. The sea is parted. They walk across dry ground and they safely get to the other side. Egypt chases them, the military might of this nation. And Moses closes the water and, and wipes them all out. And that's the end of the story. And Moses rides off into the sunset with the people of God, right? So now you can go home. You've had church. There's nothing more to talk about here, right? No, of course not. Don't turn off the browser. Don't leave the room yet, right? Because so often, especially stories like this, they can become so familiar to us that we miss the power. We miss the, what, do, what does it mean for me today? And so we want to be able to look at this example more clearly uh, that, that we are not done with what God is doing, right? Now, the example from this story to, for us today is not simply to repeat what Moses did, right? Like, is the goal for me to stand here and hold up a staff and try and part the waters of the Puget Sound? Like, no, obviously that's not the example. That's not the takeaway, although that'd be kind of cool, right? No, the goal is not to get God to do something miraculous, to try and trick him to do some sort of magic trick, if you will so that he proves to us from our vantage point that he's real or he can be trusted and then we trust him. No, the story that we're looking at of, of Moses leading the people of God across the Red Sea is one of learning to trust, to trust when our circumstances, they don't look like it's gonna work out for us. We're confused why we are where we are, we feel stuck. And yet we can learn from this story, this example of trusting in these moments. And so um, we're gonna jump in today into Exodus 13, and we're going to pick up in verse 17. And so it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And so this cloud and this pillar of fire, they represent really God's presence with his people and his leading and his comfort. And what's interesting about this, there's this note here of Joseph saying, hey, when, when you leave for this land that God's promised, take my bones with you. Now, what I don't think Joseph realized and thought at the time would that would be over 400 years later. You know, one of the things right off the bat here in this, in this account that we see is an example for us is that really our expectations and God's timetables 
often don't rhyme. They don't match up in our lives the way we want to. And really, from the outset, we see that this story about being able to trust God's leading, to trust the process that God has us in, in this moment. And so let's continue to look uh, in Exodus 14, picking up, picking up back in verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And so the Israelites did this. You know, I think where God leads us is no accident. Right? I'm sure the people were freaking out with their backs up against a wall of water with nowhere to go, no boats, no support, feeling trapped. And yet that's where God had led them. Uh, and really it's a terrible military strategy to put themselves in the position where they're in depth. No escape route and the might of this powerful nation is bearing down on them. What are the people of God going to do? Why does God really, why does he lead them to the place they're in? And I believe it's to prove to them even to us today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it's not our plans, it's not our smarts, it's not our trying and striving that ultimately is going to lead us to where God wants to take us. Ultimately, it's trusting God himself to lead us there and to lead us to those places. And there's really even a bigger thing at work that God is doing here. There's a verse here. I want to reread it to you because I want to see if you caught this. Look back in the passage where it says, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Did you catch that? That at this moment, even for the people of God, even this miraculous thing that God's going to do for them, God's concern is not only for them. His concern is also that Egypt, even the oppressor in this case, will come to know who God is, the one true God of the universe. And so, again, Pharaoh's thinking he's got them, they're trapped, uh, and things can go back to normal, but God has something different in mind. Let's pick back up in verse 10. It says, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So often, I think we can find ourselves in this situation where we limit God. Do you catch the people of God in this instance thought we, had, we have two options. We're just stuck in slavery or there's death in the desert. And so let's just stick with, with slavery and being stuck there. Let's, let's not risk this death in the desert thing. And because really they felt it, it was a binary choice. There were just two options. And while there is one true God of the universe, far too often we limit how he can work in our lives to these kind of binary things. We put it as if like God brings us a menu with two options on how he can work in our lives on it. He's so much more powerful than that. He's, so, he's got so much more for us. And so this, this actually comes up a lot uh, in church, right? We, we kind of think of these binary option things like, well, if you're really going to reach young people, it's the older people who, who give more. So, right, you have to reach young people or not have money. And we think about church like that sometimes. It's like, how foolish. We, we don't have to think in either or categories in this case. And in fact, as Mike talked about, Pastor Mike talked about last week in our really desire to grow young as a church. When churches really truly are intergenerational, reaching every generation, young as well as old, those are vibrant churches where older people love to be at and love to support and younger people love to be at as well. And that's the kind of church that we want to build. We don't have to settle for this binary either or thinking when it comes to church. You know, another, another thing I hear sometimes as a pastor is, well, it's all good and fine to talk about focusing on reaching people outside, and I get that, but, but what about caring for those inside? Like, isn't that, isn't that where we should really focus and make sure that's happening first? And again, this is faulty binary thinking, because if you're a person who's thinking about, I'm thinking about others who aren't part of our group yet, you're practicing selfless thinking. 
You're not being selfish. And guess what? In order to experience true community that's healthy within the church, you have to be selfless as well. I think when we look outside and we say, how can I help people join in? It actually enables us to practice healthy New Testament community better. We can practice these one another's with each other, love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, bear with one another's burdens. We can only do that if we're not being selfish. And so again, just so many things, even when it comes to how we think about church sometimes, we can be like the people of God here in this moment with their backs up against the Red Sea, that there's only two ways to work. And God is so much bigger and beyond that. God is able to do so much more than that. God is not somebody who's boxed in, okay? We are the ones who limit and box God in in our lives. And so let's continue to look at this story and pick back up um, before we kind of get too far down the road here. It says, verse 13, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Now this word, this, this phrase here in verse 14, it sounds so, it sounds so nice. Oh, the Lord's going to fight for you. You only need to be still. What's interesting is in the Hebrew, that phrase is only two words. And literally, it sounds something more like this. Moses is saying, you, shut it. Like, that's not nice, Moses. <laughs> Why are you so angry, Moses, right? Because here's the thing. He's, he's, he's really kind of just putting this in his people's face. He wants them to know, hey, hey, stop talking about your problems and actually listen to what it is that God wants you to do. Listen to what it looks like for you to trust him in this moment. And so he's forcefully drawing their attention to that. And so, so often I believe we just need to, again, stop talking about our problems and truly listen to how God is leading us forward. Because again, we're the ones who limit God so often. And God is saying, I have so many ways that I want to work in your life. Will you trust me? There's this beautiful prayer that the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3, and I just want to read a small piece of it. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Again, we don't want to be a people that limit God to just this or that in terms of how he can work. As we learn what it means to trust to God to pursue him fully with our lives, let's be a people who understand the great power of God that can be at work in our lives even today. And so back to the story, back to Moses. Again, he's got the back against the wall. The nation of Israel's with him. Egypt is coming. He raises his staff. He obeys God. And the, the waters of the sea part. This massive expanse of dry ground opens up and he moves the entire nation of people across to safety. And let's jump back in where the Egyptians are chasing after them. And so in verse 23, it says, The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, and not one of them survived." And so there's so much that we could learn here from this account, right? But we've got to note some ironies that the vast might of the Egyptian army here has been drowned in the water where this one infant so many years ago, baby Moses, couldn't be drowned in the Nile River. The Nile itself that was this source of life and prosperity for Egypt, water was life, now has brought about their demise and their destruction. And so... It raises a question that a lot of us can struggle with sometimes. Like, this seems a bit savage for God to do, right? Like, how how are we okay with this? How do we reconcile this? 
And I think understanding the original context, what's really going on here, can help us with this a little bit. Because the reality is that the pharaohs view themselves not just as kings, not just as leaders, but as manifestations of God himself on earth. And so the God of the day for the Egyptians at this moment in history was Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra kind of combined in himself the fertility God and the solar God and the creator God all in one. He was like the Zeus of his age. Uh, And so in his hands, you can actually see this picture uh, that we have uh, from archaeological evidence of the Pharaoh holding in one hand this ankh that symbolizes life. It's kind of cross the loop shape on top. And he's got a staff in his other hand, which represents well-being and dominion. And so the battle here, right, is between which God can be trusted? Who has these powers? Is it the God of this slave nation? Or is it Amun-Ra? Which God would the people trust? And it begs the question for us today as well, what God are we trusting in our lives? because so often we make that decision on a pragmatic basis. Which God is going to work for me? Rather than asking the question, which God is worthy of my worship? That's the proper question to ask, because if we're just deciding what kind of God I'm gonna worship based upon what's gonna work for me pragmatically, I've got a messed up view, I've got a jacked up view of God that's gonna bring a lot of pain and hurt into my life ultimately. It's not gonna help me move from being stuck in my life. And so even picking the option of living your life as if God doesn't exist and and maybe you're you're struggling with, I don't know if he is or not this morning. And so maybe it's just easier for you to live your life as if he's not there. Maybe hope at the end he is. Uh, But that's often a pragmatic decision, trying to just make sense of life instead of asking the question of truly about the nature of who God is, the nature of who is truly worthy to be worshiped. Maybe you've gone through some personal hurt in your life. Maybe you've been burnt by the church even, and you're having a difficult time reconciling that pain to being able to trust God, to help you move from being stuck to being able to move forward. You know, I don't know what is going on in your life, but I do know that our decision is no different than thousands and thousands of years ago. The people of God had to make a decision who they were going to trust. Who were they going to truly worship? And we have to make the same decision today in our lives as well. Let's see how the story finishes up here. Picking back up in verse 29. But the Israelites went through the sea on the dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And so the people ultimately... They put their trust in Yahweh to lead them as their one true God and to put their trust in Moses, his servant. And there's some amazing parallels here between the saving activity that Moses does here and what happens about 1,500 years later in the life of Jesus. See, where Moses extends his arm out and his staff to lead his people to safety across the sea, Jesus, 1,500 years later, is going to extend both his arms out across a wooden Roman cross to extend salvation to all people. Where Moses buries the enemies of the people of God in the Red Sea and and defeats them, Jesus buries the enemies of sin and death in a tomb and he walks out victorious over those from the empty tomb. You know, so there's so many parallels here. Just one more that as Moses led the people to, again, a new life across the Red Sea, we are called to live a new life in Christ. And in fact, Jesus says, we read it in John 5, 24, it says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And so we see these parallels here. Don't rush over those. Take the time to think through those uh, and, and take some time to be in this passage and see how it speaks to you this morning. But one of the things that we see here is this idea of baptism. As Christians, we practice baptism, right? Because we're identifying with burying our, our sin in the waters and then we're raised up to new life. 
And so we're identifying with the life of Christ, but also we're calling back to this story. This is part of our story as the people of God, that we see his saving work happening in our lives. And so when we, when we step into this story, it can become real in our lives as well. How is God working to bring about saving, to bring about leading us to a place of not being stuck with where we are, but somewhere new that God wants to take us. And so our goal is to help as many as possible in Pierce County begin that journey of crossing over from death to life, to experiencing the life and the hope and the peace that can be found from following Jesus. But there's a little bit of a problem because in our world, really so many, uh, so many are kind of trying to figure that out, but they're being discipled by Google being discipled by YouTube. And there's nothing wrong with those platforms, but it's creating a lot of confusion about what it means to truly follow Jesus and be a follower of Jesus. And it's leading to a lot of tribes of Christians criticizing other tribes of Christians and criticizing those outside the church. And it's not helpful. And we want to answer the question, how do we figure out, how do we out of all of the noise, of all the books and podcasts and and methods and programs and pastors and speakers and all of that, How do you figure out what a clear pathway is to follow Jesus in your life? And so I'd like to invite you to hear from Jess, our discipleship pastor, on just how you can understand what that next step in your life could be a little bit more clearly today and for all of us as we move forward together as a church. Let's hear from her. Hey guys, my name's Jess. If you don't know me, I am the pastor who's in charge of discipleship and connections and getting people just involved here at Rainier View. And so what I wanna talk to you about is If you haven't caught on by now, this summer, and I guess kind of in the whole six month of COVID crazy, we spent time with a consultant um, talking about where we wanna go as a church. And we spent time dreaming. And so what I was charged with was figuring out our discipleship pathway. And when you get to a new church, it is so confusing or can be of how to get connected. You know, you want to, you want to get involved in community, but it is so intimidating to go from woohoo, great big huge worship service to, oh, please know all of my deepest, darkest secrets. <laughs> and like, it's, it's very overwhelming. And so we have just spent time dreaming and I'm super excited to tell you a little bit about where we are going um, as a church and as a discipleship ministry. So by now, I'm sure that you've heard about Rooted. <laughs> we talk about Rooted enough, right? But we really believe in Rooted, and it's not because it's some awesome curriculum. It is great, but really what it is, it's it's about these seven spiritual rhythms. And as you go through Rooted, you learn all about these rhythms. They're rhythms that are straight from the Bible. They're nothing new. They're just packaged in a really great way. And so what we are, are doing is we want to have everybody everybody at Rainier View go through Rooted so that you understand those rhythms and you can start applying them to your life because we really believe that if you are going to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, then you are are practicing these rhythms in your daily life. And so some of those rhythms include daily devotions. Um, We have prayer um, and and a prayer experience. So of course, personal prayer, but also corporate prayer, Um, serving, celebrating, breaking strongholds. Like there are just so many um, different ways that that we want you to be connecting with God and the greater church. But beyond that, I have been charged with this idea of just dreaming of what can the future look like at Rainier View. And so I'm super excited because what I have found is that this idea of belonging Again, it's hard to go from great big, huge Sunday morning service to intimate small group. For some people, if you're like me, you're an extrovert, you're like, heck yeah, where do I sign up? I'm all for that. For other people, that's a little bit intimidating and that's okay. And so kind of what we are looking at doing is creating varying levels of intimacy so that you can engage with God, engage with the rest of the community and be growing in your faith. And so, you know, we want to have that great big, huge Sunday morning experience. We believe that that's really important to have corporate worship, corporate prayer, preaching. Um, But also what's really important is to have that next layer, which is, which is that idea of a smaller corporate experience. So we're going to be looking at having some more worship events, some more, some more opportunities for us to come together, but it's just going to be one, one layer smaller. But then we're going to start integrating those experiences that I was just talking about from Rooted. And we're going to be integrating those into our, our 
everyday lives, but also into our experiences. So we want to have a prayer experience that is targeted for women. We want to have a prayer experience targeted for men, for young families. We want to um, be, be creating smaller, intimate um, communities, but not all the way to that tiny, small group yet. So we'll be doing prayer experiences. We'll be doing serve experiences. We'll be celebrating together. There will be so many different opportunities for us to connect with other people in smaller ways. And then finally, that community group. We are still 100% committed to community groups. We believe that that is one of the greatest ways that you can grow in your faith. But we also recognize that we need some other ways to grow in our faith too. And so we just want to invite you to come in, to keep dreaming with us, keep seeing how this all unfolds in the future. But we're really excited to get people connected into community and continuing to grow in their faith so that they can be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Hey, well, so our story is also the story of continuing to be the people of the Exodus, continuing to trust God as he leads us forward, moving from where we feel stuck to the new and the good things that he has for us. And you might be wondering, where do I begin? And I can't really answer that question for you. But I know as we look at the example from God's word, that God's gonna make it clear what that next step is. Reach out to us, use that digital connect card. Let us know if you've got a next step of faith that you would like to take. We would love to help you move forward from feeling stuck wherever you are right now to the good things that God has in store for you. Because what I do know is that any next step that you take with Jesus is the right next step. Hey, we'll hope to see you back here next Sunday as we continue our series called. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give life you are love you bring light to the dark So we
Thank you to the worship team for leading us in that time. We have so many things this fall for people of all ages, and we want to make sure that you are staying in the loop about it all. The best ways to do that is through our All Church emails, by following us on Instagram, or by following us on Facebook. We are excited to keep pursuing what God is calling us to as a church. This will require us as a church to be generous with our time, our hearts, and our finances. If you call Rainier View your church home, you can give by simply texting RVCC to 77977 to use our safe and secure online system. You can also give on our website or send in a check. If you're joining us for the first time today, please don't feel any obligation to give. We're just so glad that you're here. For the remainder of our time together, we'll be worshiping through taking communion. This is just a time we take every week to dwell upon the sacrifice that Christ made for us that sets us free. So gather some bread and juice and take these reminders of Jesus' body and blood. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we hope you'll join us again next Sunday. You're hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. to the altar the father's arms are open while forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ Hallelujah.
precious love.